China's Chang'e 6 lunar probe is on its way back to Earth after collecting rock and soil samples from the far side of the moon. China's lunar probe has landed, carrying samples from an unexplored far side of the moon. In the silent vastness beyond Earth's orbit, a return journey was quietly unfolding, one that carried with it not just lunar dust, but data capable of reshaping the trajectory of space exploration. China's Chang'e 6 probe, having touched down on the moon's elusive far side, was now headed home, carrying rock and soil samples that no human or machine had ever accessed before. What was once considered a desolate, inert terrain had revealed something extraordinary. Substances and signals that could transform both the geopolitical balance and humanity's relationship with its nearest celestial neighbor. The mission, lasting just under two months, was a culmination of years of strategic focus and technological refinement. China's robotic lander had ventured deep into the South Pole Aitken Basin, an immense lunar crater over 2,500 kilometers wide and nearly 8 kilometers deep. This ancient wound on the moon's far side is believed to expose some of the oldest geological material in the solar system, layers of rock that may predate many of Earth's continental foundations. Until this moment, no mission had ever retrieved samples from this region, let alone return them to Earth. What lay within those sealed canisters stunned scientists. There were traces of volatile elements, evidence of hydrated minerals, and even unexpected crystalline compounds. Most remarkable, however, was the confirmed presence of helium-3, an isotope long theorized to be the key to clean nuclear fusion. Unlike Earth, where helium-3 is exceedingly rare due to the protective shield of the atmosphere, the moon has been bombarded by solar winds for billions of years, embedding this isotope into its regolith. Early analysis indicated that the abundance of helium-3 in the South Pole Aitken Basin far exceeded previous estimates. The implications were immediate and far-reaching. Helium-3 has long been considered the holy grail of energy research. In theory, it could be used in fusion reactors to produce vast quantities of energy without the radioactive waste associated with current nuclear technologies. The discovery of a concentrated source of this material on the lunar surface introduced a game-changing variable into global energy strategies. Space agencies around the world, especially NASA, were now forced to reckon with a new reality. For decades, Lunar exploration had been characterized by collaborative international missions and a focus on scientific research rather than territorial advantage. But China's achievement marked a decisive pivot. The moon, once seen as a symbolic destination, was rapidly becoming a strategic asset, a reservoir of untapped resources capable of reshaping economies and national power structures. Beyond the presence of helium-3, the samples returned contained other peculiarities. Some were complex silicates, never before seen in extraterrestrial geology. Others were metallic oxides with unusual electrical properties, potentially valuable for advanced electronics or next-generation solar technologies. While formal classifications were still underway within China's state-run laboratories, early disclosures hinted at the discovery of mineral forms that could eventually serve industrial, scientific, and even defense purposes. This singular mission had done more than bring back rocks. It had unearthed a layer of the moon, and perhaps of history, that had remained hidden until now. And in doing so, it had redrawn the lines of space exploration itself. The probe had operated autonomously, navigating complex terrain, identifying key sample sites, and conducting subsurface analysis with precision robotics and AI-guided instrumentation. Its success was not just a testament to engineering, but a demonstration of a maturing capability, one that could be deployed again. And soon. The South Pole Aiken Basin was not selected at random. China's space planners had clearly calculated the scientific and strategic yield of such a location. The immense depth of the basin allowed access to rock strata that had never been sampled before, potentially including fragments of the lunar mantle. If those samples could be definitively traced to deeper layers of the moon's interior, they might provide insights not only into lunar history, but into the formative epochs of the Earth-Moon system itself. Yet the broader significance went beyond geology. The Moon's far side is permanently shielded from Earth's radio interference, making it the quietest place in the solar system for deep space observations. With relay satellites now in orbit and operational, 
China had also positioned itself to establish astronomical observatories capable of listening to the earliest whispers of the universe. Cosmic microwave background radiation, faint exoplanetary signals, and perhaps even the undetectable murmurs of alien worlds. For observers in the West, these developments were more than impressive. They were unsettling. While agencies like NASA were still aligning stakeholders, updating policies, and debating funding models, China had moved swiftly from aspiration to execution. Chang'e 6 was not a solitary venture. It was part of a larger methodical sequence. Each mission built on the previous. Each deployment targeted a critical capability, precision landing, autonomous navigation, in situ analysis, sample return. The result was a technological arsenal that now included lunar drilling robots, intelligent material sorters, and systems capable of analyzing soil composition in real time. This was more than scientific enthusiasm. It was infrastructure in the making. Designs were already in progress for modular power stations, communication arrays, and even preliminary shelter systems. With the raw materials confirmed to exist, water ice for life support, and fuel, helium-3 for energy, rare silicates for electronics, the vision of a self-sustaining lunar outpost no longer seemed speculative. China, through its deliberate and well-funded efforts, was edging closer to industrializing the moon. Water ice, in particular, adds another layer of urgency. Found in permanently shadowed craters near the lunar poles, this substance can be electrolyzed into hydrogen and oxygen. Ingredients essential not only for breathing and hydration, but for producing rocket fuel. If harvested and processed on site, these resources could enable spacecraft to refuel on the moon, dramatically reducing the cost and complexity of missions to Mars and beyond. The moon would no longer just be a stepping stone. It would be the first node in a deep space transportation network. Meanwhile, China's embrace of artificial intelligence had begun to pay dividends. The autonomous systems deployed on the lunar surface displayed a high degree of independence. With communication delays between Earth and the Moon stretching up to several seconds, the ability to make real-time decisions without human input is essential. The robots on Chang'e 6 adjusted their behavior dynamically, avoiding hazards, prioritizing data, and making judgment calls about what to collect, all without awaiting approval from mission control. These machines were no longer tools. They were team members. Such autonomy has implications far beyond lunar geology. It points toward a future in which space missions may not require astronauts at all, at least in the early stages. Human explorers are expensive, vulnerable, and politically complicated. Robotic systems, in contrast, can be scaled, replicated, and sent into hazardous environments without hesitation. This shift changes not just the logistics of space exploration, but its very philosophy. Instead of missions built around human endurance, future operations may be designed around machine intelligence. As the world looked on, it became clear that the Chang'e 6 mission represented a turning point, not only for China, but for the entire spacefaring world. The moon was no longer a backdrop for flag planning ceremonies or philosophical musing. It had become a site of real consequence. Scientific potential, economic opportunity, and strategic dominance were converging on its surface. And for the first time in modern history, it appeared that the first nation to arrive might also be the first to stay. As samples from the lunar far side arrived on Earth, the race to decode their secrets intensified. Scientists in China moved swiftly, initiating high-resolution spectrographic scans and atomic scale analyses of the collected material. Early results were startling. The mineralogy of the samples differed. Its subsurface layers harbored materials that could change current models of lunar differentiation 
and crust formation. Particularly surprising was the presence of complex, well-ordered silicates with unusual structural stability. Some of these crystalline configurations, now under microscopic examination, appeared to exhibit properties useful for radiation shielding and thermal insulation, two of the most critical challenges in space construction. A few samples showed magnetic characteristics that scientists had not anticipated, raising the possibility that the far side's crust may have interacted with the Moon's ancient magnetic field in ways not previously understood. These findings spurred new debates in planetary science. The differences between the two hemispheres of the Moon had always puzzled researchers. Why is the far side thicker? Why does it lack the extensive lava plains that characterize the near side? The samples retrieved by Chang E6 might finally offer answers, perhaps pointing to a history of massive asymmetric impacts, or to internal thermal currents that split the Moon's crust along hemispheric lines. But while the scientific community debated tectonic theories and mineral signatures, policymakers and military strategists focused on a different set of questions. If one country were to monopolize access to helium-3 or water ice, what would that mean for global energy markets or for the future of human presence in space? Could resource extraction become a form of celestial colonialism, veiled in scientific endeavor? Could lunar infrastructure be repurposed for surveillance or defense? The Outer Space Treaty, signed in 1967, remains the most widely accepted framework governing space activities. It prohibits nations from claiming sovereignty over celestial bodies, but leaves considerable ambiguity about resource extraction. Now that ambiguity was no longer theoretical. China's successful sample return had crossed a boundary, showing that valuable materials could not only be identified, but physically removed and studied. A loophole in space law had become a live wire in global diplomacy. Legal scholars began to voice concerns. If one nation builds permanent infrastructure on the moon and begins sustained resource extraction, does that create de facto ownership? Would others be excluded from these zones under the guise of safety or operational necessity? Could the moon's most valuable craters, ridges, and shadowed basins become privatized by proxy? China's political and scientific leadership remained relatively quiet on the subject, letting their actions speak louder than policy statements. Even as global agencies scrambled to interpret the implications, new blueprints for permanent lunar facilities were quietly being finalized. Satellite imagery revealed construction mock-ups, solar array testbeds, and mobility trials for multi-legged cargo robots in remote Chinese. The testing zones, all modeled after lunar terrain. These preparations indicated a long-term vision, one that extended far beyond a single mission. The goal was not to visit the moon, it was to settle it, to operate on it, and to build a foundation of continuous presence. And in doing so, China was moving closer to shaping the rules of a future, where space is not merely explored, but inhabited. Meanwhile, the geopolitical balance was beginning to shift. Spacefaring nations such as India, Japan, and members of the European Space Agency began to recalibrate their timelines and ambitions. Missions that had once been planned for the late 2030s were suddenly being pushed forward. NASA, already heavily invested in the Artemis program, now faced mounting pressure to accelerate its crude return to the moon. But sending humans is slow, costly, and constrained by risk. Robotic missions, fast, agile, and comparatively inexpensive, were proving to be the strategic weapon of this new lunar era. Where the United States had once pioneered space exploration, it now found itself in a reactive stance. For decades, American space policy had centered on fostering international cooperation and supporting private sector innovation. But those same strengths had become limitations in a race where coherence and speed were paramount. China's centralized planning and integrated public-private model had allowed it to build momentum without needing broad consensus. The advantage was not just technological, it was systemic, and that system was beginning to mature into something formidable. As engineers analyzed the performance of Chang'e 6's automated drilling arms and sample sorters, it became evident that China had achieved a level of autonomy and precision previously unseen in extraterrestrial missions. The robotic platforms could identify stratigraphic layers, adjust drilling pressure based on rock density, and store samples with minimal contamination, all without real-time human control. This kind of autonomy wasn't limited to excavation. Communication systems had evolved as well. 
Relay satellites in lunar orbit enabled continuous contact with the far side, while experimental optical networks were being tested to transmit high volumes of data between the Moon and Earth using encoded laser pulses. These high bandwidth channels could eventually support not just telemetry and video, but even AI-guided command systems, allowing robotic outposts to update Earth-based systems in near real time. With each layer of capability added, China moved closer to a future where the moon becomes a functioning node of civilization. Plans were emerging for power generation using in-situ materials, such as assembling solar panels directly from lunar silicates and conductive oxides. The long days and consistent illumination near the South Pole made it an ideal location for harvesting solar energy. Some speculative designs proposed beaming excess energy via microwaves or lasers to orbiting satellites, perhaps even to Earth, laying the groundwork for space-based energy grids. At the same time, scientific curiosity remained central. The regular samples brought back contained isotopic anomalies that did not match known lunar distributions. Some particles appeared to have originated from deeper layers of the moon's mantle, offering rare insight into planetary formation processes. Others suggested exposure to ancient cosmic events like gamma ray bursts or early solar superstorms preserved in the moon's airless, geologically static environment. These anomalies reignited questions about the moon's origin. Was the giant impact theory, long the favored explanation, still sufficient? Or did these new elements point to a more complex birth, perhaps involving material exchanges between Earth and other celestial bodies early in the solar system's history? The far side samples, undisturbed for eons, now offered a glimpse into that buried epoch. This level of discovery and ambition began to influence more than just science or policy, it shaped culture. Chinese media rapidly adapted the Chang'e 6 success into a source of national pride. Documentaries were aired, classroom lessons were rewritten, and public exhibits featured life-sized replicas of the lander. A generation of students began to see the moon not as a distant mystery, but as a reachable domain, part of their inheritance. This cultural momentum had consequences. It created a feedback loop of public interest, government funding, and institutional support. The narrative of China's space program was no longer centered on catching up. It was about leading and defining the next chapter of human expansion. The moon was not the final destination. It was the beginning. Back on Earth, strategic analysts watched with growing concern. Military theorists discussed the dual-use potential of lunar installations. A base built to monitor solar radiation could just as easily track satellite trajectories. Communication hubs meant for science could be converted into surveillance relays. The idea of a neutral moon, long enshrined in treaties and public imagination, was beginning to fracture under the weight of modern reality. And the clock was ticking. Infrastructure builds upon itself. A power unit enables a refinery. A refinery enables manufacturing. A manufacturing site enables habitation. With each successful mission, China was laying bricks in a foundation that others had not yet begun to pour. By the time another nation caught up, they might find that the critical decisions, the locations, the methods, the rules had already been decided. The lunar surface, long untouched, was becoming a theater not just of exploration, but of influence. And China had made its move. If this glimpse into China's bold lunar vision helped you see the future more clearly, or sparked new questions about where humanity is headed, don't keep it to yourself. Like, share, and subscribe for more deep dives into the seismic shifts happening above our heads.